We're going to talk about UFOs. Now, this is an area that uh, most people tend to relegate to the demented or incompetent or fringe type people. And yet, uh, the entertainment industry, of course, has uh, picked up on this with the uh, 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 crop circle thing called Signs, which may, many uh, may have seen. And also, uh, Steven Spielberg did a mini series called Taken, focusing on the abductions and so forth. And uh, while these things are interesting entertainment, they are replete, of course, with all kinds of misinformation and, and uh, legends and uh, half-truths that get mingled with facts so that it's uh, really just entertainment. But one of the things you and I have to face is, uh, what is the real reality here? Is this just a bunch of nonsense, a, a composite of hoaxes and, and pranks by various people through the years? Or is there something really going on? One of the things we want to explore a little tonight is, are the UFOs real? And if so, where are they from? What's their agenda? Are they friendly or hostile? And uh, more, most important, what does the Bible say about them? So we're going to explore that tonight as we go forth on our exp exploration of UFOs and the strange term, the Nephilim. Uh, what is that all about? But before we start, since we are dealing with a very, very complicated area, an area where many of us have already formed opinions, let me remind you of the, there's a principle. According to Edmund Spencer, he, he articulated this, there's a principle which is a bar against all information. It's proof against all argument. And it's something which cannot fail to keep man in everlasting ignorance. And that principle is condemnation before investigation. So one of our challenges as we go into this very complicated topic is to set aside our prejudices and presuppositions and let's see what we can uh, find out. Now, the same idea is not only uh, articulated by Edmund Spencer, but it also is in our uh, uh, collection of Proverbs by Solomon, who reminds us that he that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. So one of our challenges tonight is sort of set aside what we think we may have heard or what, we, what our basic prejudices are, and let's see what we can find out that might be new. Now, many of us, of course, have seen photographs, many of which are hoaxes, contrived, and so forth. Uh, there are many of these in the literature. I'm sure you've seen all kinds. Uh, the problem is, is that not all of them are. It may surprise you to learn that there are over 3,000 authenticated photographs in the classified community that are uh, authenticated. So what's really going on here? See, the, the problem we have in researching this area is there is so much that's uncorroborated. There's a lot of deliberate disinformation and certainly a lot of data which is unreliable. And uh, the problem is when you strip away the hoaxes and you strip away the nonsense and you set aside the uncorroborated, there still is too much to ignore that is substantiated that involves multiple reliable witnesses, including multiple radar sightings. And uh, radars generally don't have hallucinations. And uh, this idea of being plotted simultaneously on multiple radars is something that should get our attention. I happen to remember this vividly because in June 30th of 1952, I was entering the United States Naval Academy. So I was a plebe, uh, or I should say, yeah, a plebe at, um, uh, at Annapolis uh, when this was in the papers and much talked about at the time. It turns out a number of UFOs harassed Washington National Airport, which in those days was the only airport there. We didn't have Dulles. This is before Dulles and uh, also Andrews Air Force Base so badly they had to shut down the air traffic. And this went on and off and on for a week. And it was in the papers, because every time the Air Force would alert jets to investigate what these things were, they would disappear. As soon as the jets landed, they came back. And uh, uh, fiery objects overrun jets over Capitol in the Washington Post. These are headlines from that period. Now, one of the things there again, they never really explained it. They issued some cover stories, but the truth of the matter is they didn't know what it was, and it wasn't just an incident one night. It went off and on for the better part of a week. Again, a mis it created a problem just in blocking all the phone traffic because everybody's calling what's going on and so forth, and, and so something real was happening because you're talking here multiple radars 
This isn't some, you know, impressionable, uh, unprofessional observer. This was uh, the Air Force Air Controllers at the Washington National and Andrews Air Force Base, and uh, never explained, at least not to the public. 1993. That there, you know, by the way, there are thousands of these things to select from. I've just picked a few that seem representative. Yeah, over in Mexico City in 1993, the population by the thousands were uh, upset and disturbed by what went on. Uh, Seoul, South Korea, November 23rd of 1996, CNN and Reuters reported a huge cigar-shaped UFO that was televised for 10 minutes on national television. You know, when we talk about witnesses, there's all kinds of people, many very reliable professionals that have contributed to this background, but the ones that you and I would tend to presume would be the most reputable, most trained, and most uh, competent in this area would be our astronauts. You think they know something about it. Do you realize that 13 of them have gone on record uh, of seeing UFOs while they were doing their missions? Uh, Ed Mitchell, Apollo 14, April 1996, and it was, this was on uh, Dateline NBC. He said, NASA <clears throat> is covering up what really happened at Roswell, New Mexico. See, this isn't just the presumption of some journalists or the, or the tabloids at the check, you know, checkout stands in the market. These, <laughs> these are serious people saying that something is being covered up. Astronaut Gordon Cooper has made many talks. On May 15th of 1963, he did the 22-orbit Mercury capsule. He saw a green UFO, which was also at the same time he saw it tracked by, our, uh, by the radar in Australia. It corroborated this. And he's testified before the United Nations that UFOs are visiting this planet. And uh, in May 1996, he said, we are being visited by aliens. So he's, settled, he's spoken a lot about this, so much so that some people tend to write him off. James Lovell, Frank Borman, <coughs> Borman excuse me, Gemini 7, December 1965. On the second orbit of their two-week flight, they saw a UFO. Gemini Control presumed it was the stage of their own Titan booster. But they indicated that they had both the booster and the UFO in sight, so that doesn't quite jive. Walter Schirra, these are all familiar names to most of us. Mercury 8, 1968. He was the first guy to use the term Santa Claus to indicate UFOs are near the space capsule. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, was about December, so everybody thought that this was just a cute quip, but it was a code word. And this was, it was later uh, in 1979, Maurice Chatelain, the chief of NASA communications, confirmed that the Santa Claus phrase was a prearranged code word to deal with the UFOs without alarming the public. And uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, are these familiar names to you? Are these guys competent? On Apollo 11, July 21st, 1969, both apparently saw lights in and on a crater and there, there are unconfirmed reports that there were other spacecraft there. Some of this is classified, gets classified quickly, so we're, tra we're treading on dangerous ground. But they have said two large objects were watching them. And Armstrong is quoted in some reports of a CIA cover-up. Now those reports get uh, squelched, of course, so you, it's hard to separate what was just you know, urban legend and what really happened. But if you go to Ed White, James McDivitt, James Lovell, Borman, Shira, Gordon Cooper, these guys are all, have all reported UFOs. Neil Armstrong, Apollo 11, Buzz Aldrin, Apollo 11, Ned Mitchell, Apollo 14, and on it goes. And uh, one of the most interesting ones is John Blaha. He was a veteran of five space shuttle missions. He also was a relatively recent resident of the Russian Mir space station this a few years ago. Uh, March 24th of 1989, an amateur radio operator picked up an exer uh, a, a intercept about, uh, said, Houston, this is discovery. We still have the alien spacecraft under observation. And uh, very impressive to listen to that soundtrack and hear if the familiar voice uh, say these rather strange things. What's the biblical view? And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the days of Noah. You know, Jesus uh, gave four disciples a confidential briefing on his second coming. And uh, uh, the four disciples came to him to inquire of his return, and he detailed the preceding events that would uh, occur prior to his second coming. And his answer to them, these four guys, is so important, it's recorded in three of the four Gospels, Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13, and Luke 21 and 22. 
But he opens and closes that briefing with a, a, a repeated admonition. Take heed that no man deceive you. And that occurs in Matthew 24, 4, and you'll find it's the theme of, of, of the, the entire presentation. We're dealing here in spiritual matters, and the attempt of the enemy will be to deceive us.